Welcome back to the afternoon session of this conference today. Um, and we've had a change to the order due to the vagaries of the parliamentary calendar. So I'd like to invite um, the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, to come and speak to us. Um, he's said that um, children's and um, adolescent mental health is the biggest single area of weakness in NHS provision and has vowed to t make it a top priority. So we're absolutely delighted that he's come to the launch of the Commission's report today. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Emily, and I'm sorry that the whips have meant that I have had to cause a slight change in the programme, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to participate in this morning's discussion. And the first thing I want to do, actually, is to thank you, Emily, because um, we had a great mental health team in the last Parliament. Um, Norman got the glory, which he deserves, um, but actually Emily did the work. <laughs> and uh, she really was a fantastic force for good in the Department of Health, and... Uh, um, she made a huge contribution by her uh, forensic attention to detail and, and the very sensible policy ideas that she came forward with. And um, also, it's very good to be at an event hosted by David Laws. I can't see where David... Oh, there he is. David's there. Um, uh, my former Lib Dem brothers and sisters. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, and I wish you every success with the Education Policy Institute. Um, since... Uh, the new government under Theresa May, I decided to take personal responsibility for mental health in the health portfolio. So we don't have a, a mental health minister anymore, and I'm covering off those responsibilities. Um, I did it for a number of reasons, but um, I discovered in the last parliament that it, even if you can't find extra money, it is actually possible to make a very big difference by focusing, zooming in on particular areas and I think Norman showed that very successfully with his focus on mental health. I don't think there's any minister who has, who has done that better. Uh, and as he was doing that, I was having a big focus on dementia, where I was pleased that we also made very big progress. And I, I felt that this was the right moment for uh, me to take personal responsibility for what happens in mental health. And uh, since I have done that, only in a matter of months, and you know, you will forgive me, but I think everyone in this room will know far more about mental health issues than I do. Um, but I have been very proud um, by what I have seen is happening and starting to happen. I think um, despite the many, many problems in mental health provision, it is worth acknowledging that um, over the last five years there has been real progress and we are now treating uh, 1,400 more people every day for mental health conditions than we were back in 2010. Um, we've got new laws like parity of esteem, new waiting times targets, um, and so on. And I think that has really begun to move the needle. And I'm also very excited and proud of the progress, even in the last year, where the um, independent report by Paul Farmer has given us a very good blueprint as to what parity of esteem should mean between now and 2020. And very cleverly and wisely, he's put in some very... Um, non-dodgeable <laughs> targets in there, like 600,000 more people on IAP, 70,000, I memorised them, 70,000 on uh, 30,000 more helped uh, perinatally and 29,000 unemployed people helped. And those are very specific objectives which will require um, serious investment in the mental health workforce, which has to be the starting point. Um, but I think most of all, I've just been very proud to meet so many fantastic people in the NHS working in mental health. Um, I met a uh, liaison psychiatrist nurse in Northumbria who told me that last year one of the patients that she had been counselling the next day threw himself off a bridge. And, you know, that is an incredible thing to have to cope with just in a day's work. And I met uh, last week, I went to see... Um, a, a mental health inpatient unit called Ash Villa in Lincolnshire, and I met a remarkable psychologist who was telling me there are 13 beds in this inpatient unit and 11 of them are girls, and she was talking about the impact of social media um, and how that's really changed things, and that's something I want to come back to in a minute. Um, and I just think there are incredible people working in mental health, and um, we, we can be very proud of that. Um, so, um, you know, I think the, we have a very good plan on the table. 
and um, it's absolutely the number one priority to implement that plan, and I don't want to get deflected from that. Um, but I have decided to make a specific priority of CAMS, and I do hope to go even further than Paul Farmer's report when it comes to CAMS, because I think there is more that can be done and more that needs to be done. Um, the first point to observe is that if we implement that report, we're currently treating one in four young people who need mental health conditions, and it goes down to one in three. So we're leaving out two in three by that calculation. And uh, I think that the one message that I have picked up so much that really and truly I can tell you, you don't need to tell me in the questions, is that prevention is better than cure and early intervention counts. I, I know that everyone is uh, very passionate about that. I am too, and I'm, obviously I'm understand that half of mental health conditions become established before people are 14. And that's another reason to think really hard about children, not just about CAMS, but about children and young people's provision. Um, and so um, that is the piece of work that we're doing. Um, and I hope I'm not breaking a state secret to say, but I, I was very proud uh, four weeks ago to have almost an entire full cabinet session devoted to mental health and actually I devoted it mainly to children's mental health. And so I think there is engagement. This is a personal commitment of Theresa May. She is absolutely, she's always been interested in mental health. I think from her time at Home Secretary when uh, so, many, so many people in the police force and the justice system told her that unless we tackle the problems of mental health, we're not actually going to be helping them to reduce crime. And so she's always had a, a very strong personal interest. So um, I want to give you some time for questions, but I, I just, uh, I'll just say three things. First of all, it is very important that we do implement the commitments we have on bringing down waiting times. I think today um, makes very sobering reading when it comes to particularly the maximum waiting time. I, mean, I don't think we should be asking any parent to wait six months for an appointment uh, if their child is in has got you know, real mental health problems. I think that's just too long. And so the, the new waiting times, maximum waiting times for the first episode of psychosis and for eating disorders um, and for um, talking therapies, which is what we are now calling IAP, um, because it's a bit more understandable. Those we are absolutely committed to doing. I think on children and young people's mental health, <clears throat> the two areas where I want to reflect on much more, and I think this comes out in, in Future in Mind as well, is first of all, what we do in schools. Um, I completely agree that the, the tier system is, is, you know, frankly not working. Um, and we have this ridiculous situation at the moment where people are uh, approach a CAM service at tier three and they're told they're not ill enough to be helped. And they have to wait until they're mental health condition deteriorates before CAMS is able to help them. And that is completely wrong and counterproductive. Um, and I think tier two is, um, is sometimes tier zero because I'm not quite sure whether really a huge amount happens at tier two or at least certainly not as much as we would want to happen. I think GPs do a, a very valiant job. But I think what happens in schools is, is where there is the most potential. And I went round a school called Cardinal Newman School, a Catholic secondary in Hove. And they have a full-time CAMS worker based in the school uh, four days a week. And that has really transformed that school's understanding of mental health. The teachers have someone they know who they can go to. Uh, she, in turn, is able to educate the teachers as to which are the types of conditions that a teacher can sort out. Uh, she goes to lots of meetings with parents. She both refers people more quickly to CAMS when it's something serious, um, but actually has reduced the number of CAMS referrals from that school by 10%. And I think, you know, in terms of um, well-being and, and happiness, it is actually something really um, profound that they've achieved in that school. Now, we can't have, um, you know, 20,000 people working in um, every single school in the country, but we... I think we should think about what we could do in our larger schools, what we could do in our primary schools. Um, and that's the first thing. And the second thing uh, I think we've, we've just got to have a national conversation about is the role of social media. 
and I think it is, um, I have been persuaded, I was quite sceptical about this before, that there is something very different about growing up now in the world of social media than there was in the world that I grew up in. And um, the psychologist I met in Lincolnshire explained it very well. She said that when you're bullied at school, or when of our, people of our age were bullied at school, you could go home and slam the door and escape from it, spend the weekend with your parents um, and not think about it, and perhaps until you went to school again on Monday morning. Um, but now there is no escape for it, and everything is just there constantly in your face. Um, and I think um, that is, uh, some of you may have heard that very harrowing story on, um, on I think it was the PM program last week about someone who uh, took his own life, um, and it was all driven by social media. The second um, thing about social media is that it encourages constant comparison, um, and sometimes that isn't healthy. Uh, my children are two, four, and six, and um, so they're a bit young for social media, thank goodness. But uh, the way this lady put it to me is she said, you know, just imagine if you don't just get a Christmas stocking, but you compare your Christmas stocking to all your other friends uh, to see who got the most. And suddenly what was an enormously pleasurable and wonderful moment of magic for a child is turned into a moment of disappointment because their stocking wasn't quite as big as their friends. Now that's in some ways a small example, but I think it is a, also a, an indication of how things change in, in social media. And I think that social media companies who are often fantastically profitable organizations with a strong social purpose need to come up with ways where they can be the solution to the problems of mental health, mental ill health, and not simply uh, the problem. And I haven't heard much constructive thinking. Uh, you know, I just throw one question at you. I mean, why is it that uh, phone companies allow people to uh, send a text with a sexually explicit image on it? There's absolutely no reason why people under 18 couldn't just be blocked from sending those kinds of images. And, you know, we can have a debate about whether people should be allowed to unblock it if that's what their parents choose. But the point is there is technology is the solution to so many things. And I think technology could be the solution. There are fantastic uh, mental health apps now that do an amazing job. And, uh, and I think we need to challenge social media companies to say you can be part of the solution, but we need you to step up to the mark. Um, let me just finish by saying that, you know, all of us are right to be engaging with this issue um, as the world wakes up to the power of um, good mental health treatment. Um, but we also, I don't think, should be too gloomy. Sir Simon Wesley, the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, often says that he thinks that we probably have some of the best mental health provision in the world in this country. And because, rightly, the NHS is a free at the point of use system, we are very conscious in the NHS of the unmet demand because price is not a mechanism that's rationing supply, and we don't want it to be. But um, you know, I think we should also recognize there is some good work happening, and if we get this right, uh, the NHS can blaze a trail throughout the world, and that's what I'm absolutely determined will happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>